when that really starts happening and people start thinking we're underweight in gold, look at the effect on gold itself. You know, when people start going into ETFs or however they invest their portfolios into gold, there is no gold there for them because the central banks have been basically cleaning out the refiners. I mean, there is no big liquidity in the market at all. This is Kaiser Johnson with Liberty and Finance, and these are the Miles Franklin Weekly Specials for January 29th through February 5th, 2024, while supplies last. This week we have Silver Valcambi or Asahi 100 ounce bars at just $1.39 over spot per ounce. We also feature pre-1933 gold $10 and $20 Liberties at $89 over melt and $139 over melt respectively. Next, backdated one ounce silver maples are at $3.75 over spot with a minimum order of 50. To order our specials or any of the many other options we have available, call us at 1-888-81-LIBERTY. That's 1-888-815-4237. We're available after hours and on weekends, and we look forward to speaking with you. Welcome back to Liberty and Finance. We're delighted to have this distinguished returning guest, Alistair McLeod, a former bank director and now the head of research at goldmoney.com, joins us this Wednesday, January 31st, 2024. Alistair, thank you for joining us again on Liberty and Finance. That's my pleasure, DK. There's been incremental uh, degradation in uh, banking health and you've warned us about that. You've warned us that this is a, a looming specter uh, globally, not just in the US where we had the uh, three uh, bank failures in 2023 that were the second, third and fourth largest bank failures ever in the US. Uh, today, uh, we're seeing a struggling uh, bank as well. We wanted to get you to weigh in on your view of the overall health of the banking system and then to talk to us about your outlook for gold for 2024 and how you see Middle East geopolitics forming a potential crisis that's uh, leading a lot of global players to shift positions that, that may be influential to all of our lives. So can we start first with the banking system, uh, I guess the, the degradation in health of the banking system, the increased risks of the banking system that you've been warning us about and what the latest developments are there in the trend that you're still watching? Yeah. Um I mean, the problem with the banking system really is it starts almost from the um, central banks downwards, because, as I've said on your show before, the central banks are deeply into negative equity. If um, they had to behave like the rest of us, there would be uh, the directors would be in jail by now. But, um, you know, <laughs> these these are these are government organizations, so they get away with it. Um, but we've had uh, this morning, and this is um, Wednesday the 31st, um, we've had uh, news that um, the New York Community Bank Hall shares have, um, well, collapsed is too strong a word, I suppose. At one stage, they've done about 40%, uh, hitting new lows. Um, this is not really good news. Um, this is telling us the market is is effectively having a run on the bank, if you like. Um, so I suppose that this is all going to come back into the headlines in the next few days. Um, it might help gold, um, but I'm going to put that to one side for a moment. We'll talk about that later. Um, I think, I mean, the problem with the banking system is that when banks uh, basically are overstretched and trying to reduce the risks um, that they face, um, then start things start going wrong. And I'll give you another example. Um, we've had the Evergrande um, uh, collapse in in uh, the, the Hong Kong courts, where it was ruled that um, the proposed reconstructing uh, wasn't going to work, and so on. Um, and um, as I understand it, uh, the value of Hong Kong property has taken a bit of a dive on it now. Um, this makes one wonder. I mean, I'm sitting in the UK. We've got two banks in the UK which are very heavily involved in Hong Kong. Um, Hong Kong Shanghai Bank, obviously, which now calls itself HSBC, and um, uh, Standard Chartered. I mean, these are two uh, banks very, very busy in the Far East and uh, particularly in Hong Kong. So. Um, I would not be surprised uh, to see that um, questions will be asked about uh, their solvency and so on. So that's likely to begin to impact uh, the banking sector in the UK. 
Um, I think these, it's a, you know, there's nothing really specific. I mean, when you get New York Community Bank Corp getting into trouble, I mean, we're not talking a major bank or anything like that. Um, I have no idea what the size of the balance sheet is, but I don't think really it's it's all that important. Um, but I think it's just the indication that this problem has not gone away. And furthermore, um, the interest rate outlook, I think, is being driven as much as anything by the tightness of bank credit. Why is bank credit tight? Well, bank credit's tight because banks don't want to lend money to businesses because they see um, uh, business conditions um, at very, very best stagnant. And at worst, I mean, particularly up and down the country, um, you know, small and medium sized businesses um, are struggling and they need um, uh, cash flow replacement and they go to the banks in order to have an overdraft. And the banks are basically saying either no or if they do offer uh, overdraft facilities, it's with goodness knows how much extra collateral and all the rest of it, um, you know, like directors' houses and so on, <laughs> that they have to put up for collateral. And on top of that, um, uh, you know, the rate is high. So this idea that interest rates are, are falling, forget it. When you get a, um, a shortage of credit, the rates actually rise. And I don't see anyone actually fully understanding this in the, you know, in all the commentary that I that I read um, on the Internet and here on YouTube and the radio. So um, I think the I, I mean, we've got the FOMC uh, meeting that's going to play out uh, a little after this um, uh, is recorded. Um, and the market hopes that um, there will be a slightly softer tone. Um, I mean, you've seen the yield on the um, uh, U.S. Treasuries uh, um, ease off in the last few days ahead of this meeting, uh, which tells me that the word on the street is that, you know, this is going to be slightly softer, etc. cetera. Um, but that's not actually what this is about. This is about um, uh, liquidity going away from the people who really need um, uh, uh, banking facilities towards the US government. I mean, why is it that um, they seem to be funding themselves so easily? Well, the answer is it's all being done in the T-bill market. The banks and the money funds are basically putting everything, um, all their liquidity into the T-bill market. Why do they do that? Because the regulators tell them that this is a risk-free option. They're getting out of risk. That's all this, this is about. So um, the banking problem, I think, is it is a global problem. Um, it embraces not just uh, the American banking system, but also the euro system, um, Japan. Um, and Japan has been trying to sit on on uh, bond yields because it knows that if bond yields rise, not only does that make the situation as far as the Bank of Japan is concerned, really frightening, but also Japanese banks are very highly leveraged. I mean, they've got um, asset to equity ratios uh, in the region of 20 times. I mean, that is that is staggering. You don't normally get um, at the top of the lending cycle. You don't normally get it that extreme. Uh, and so, I mean, it got there basically because uh, negative interest rates basically uh, compress the margins. And the only way you protect the bottom line as a banker is you leverage up your balance sheet. That's what they've done. And now, you know, we're going to pay the cost. And I think that um, this, you know, sort of New York Community Bank Corp is a bit of a canary in the gold mine. Uh, sorry, in, in the in the banking um, uh, uh, industry. So that I think, um, you know, we could be about to embark on another round of concerns about the banking system. And I think it is global. So that's, that's going to start filling the headlines again, uh, in my view. Related to that is the planned end, which was recently confirmed March 11th, the uh, cessation of any new loans from the bank term funding program, the BTFP that was initiated as a, it seems like an emergency stopgap measure by the Fed. One of the remarkable things about that, when you were mentioning it right at the beginning, <laughs> when you started was, if we did what these guys were doing, we'd be in jail. So for example, uh, valuing impaired or underwater or toxic loans at full value uh, rather than at mark to market value you know uh, things like that uh, what do you think will and we have a question from a viewer todd mctechnie 3119 says what happens in march when the btfp program ends i think it's a very interesting question um i cannot imagine that the fed has looked at 
um, the banks to which it has made this facility available and made an assessment as to whether they can actually end this or not. The fact that they have said that they're ending this in March, I think indicates that they don't see any trouble ending it. I mean, I'm sure it's going to hurt a few banks, yes, but not to the point where it threatens their solvency. So I would take that as actually a very, very positive thing. But of course, that was before we saw the New York Community Bank or problem. I mean, presumably, they're not in the, I don't know, I mean, they may, may be in, in that uh, uh, lending scheme. Um, uh, I, I must admit, I did expect this uh, scheme to be extended. Um, so um, in a sense, I'm a little surprised that it hasn't been suspended. But I take it as uh, an indication that, um, you know, th that uh, the Fed has looked at uh, these banks, uh, the banks that have participated in the, in, in, in the, in the scheme and um, I reckon uh, that it's OK. So... <coughs> So we just hope, I think, is the answer to that one, Donegan. It's going to be uh, a surprise, I'm afraid, an unpleasant one for many in the in the um, the masses who have not been aware that the banking system is in such risk and such elevated level of exposure that their bond portfolios are upside down, their real estate portfolios are upside down, many of their commercial loans are going to be uh, perhaps uh, abandoned and and just uh, people walk away rather than companies walking away rather than paying up on those. Uh, any comments from you on any of those other aspects that they're putting pressure on banks going forward? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think the sort of overall background to this is that people expect interest rates to diminish over time and uh, and bond yields uh, to fall over time as well. So that uh, you know, uh, as far as most people are concerned, this is the point of maximum pain, but it's going to get better. And that is why the S&P is where it is. Um, and um, that is why the the yield curve is sloping so negatively. And by that, we mean that, you know, the, the um, four week um, US Treasury bills yield something like 5.4%. If you go out to the 10 year, that's yielding just over 4%. So, you know, that's the, the, the extent of the negative yield curve. Uh, the expectation is that these yields um, uh, are not going to go up um, uh, materially, uh, which is why um, you get less of a yield on them than, um, you know, the short term. I think that's probably mistaken. And that, um, you know, if, if that swings back, as I expect, to reflect higher interest rates in time, then that's going to do an awful lot of damage to um, uh, not only the banking system, but to investors' portfolios. Uh, it's, it, you know, put another way, I think um, everyone, um, the market consensus, I think, has got this entirely wrong. It assumes that on the basis of um, the last 10 years experience, we can have low interest rates without inflation taking off again. And the hope is that we will return to that condition. Those of us that have been around a lot longer know that that's not the only situation which markets face. If you actually look at it more, um, if you like, sort of stand, standing back and looking at things, uh, the first thing to notice is that there is a huge budget deficit in the order of three trillion this year. That's my assessment, incidentally. It'll be roughly three trillion in this fiscal year to end September. Now, what we're talking about is an extra three trillion of um, uh, uh, credit, if you like, um, credit coming back into the GDP, uh, hoisting up GDP. And that's why GDP looks so good. But what it will do is it will also push up prices. All that, you know, it, all that extra currency just push ends up pushing up prices. Um, it's not a mechanical relation, uh, uh, relationship, but nevertheless, that is what happens. So what we're going to see is we're going to see yet more loss of purchasing power for this debauched currency um, to come. This is not over yet. And that being the case, then not only do we have uh, the commercial banking system um, uh, uh, restricting credit and therefore driving up the the cost of credit, as it were, in the, in, in the sense of interest rates. But you're going to see that the Fed is completely powerless and has no option but to raise interest rates by the end of this year. 
I mean, it it seems to me that it's 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 pretty certain that's going to happen. Now, when markets get wind of this, and it could be that the Middle Eastern situation might sort of begin to, uh, you, know, you know, wake up a few people. But when markets get wind of this, you're going to see, um, you know, the stock market in the form of equities, equity indices and so on. Um, I think that they're due for a crash. Because the valuation is already hugely stretched. The assumption in the equity market is that interest rates are going to fall. We're going to get back to low, maybe not 2% inflation, but at least something which is manageable. And we can live with interest rates in the sort of 3 to 4% le level. And that, if you like, <coughs> coupled with economic growth, I mean, it's, it's wonderful. Is it going to happen? No, it is not going to happen. That is the point. There is still a lot of um, a debauchment, currency debauchment in the pipeline, yet to undermine the purchasing power of the dollar. And it's not just the dollar, it also affects the other currencies as well. In addition to your concerns about the banks and how the uh, currency pressures, the interest rate, uh, inverted yield curve, et cetera, are, are putting strain and stress on the banks, You've also described how uh, geopolitical events are also uh, a factor in in uh, basically moving moving the, the trend one way or another. You've been watching quite closely developments in the Middle East, and you're concerned about uh, the way things are going there and that they might come to a head. Uh, what are you watching there, and why does it bring you concern? Yeah, it's the, the, the problem with something like this, Donegan, is that... Um, it, they have events like this, um, you know, very often uh, just gradually get out of control. That, I think, is the real risk. And I've just been sort of putting together an article for Thursday, which will be published on my Substack channel. Uh, and um, I've been comparing this with uh, the events of Sarajevo in uh, 1914. I mean, in on the 28th of June, um, uh, the Archduke Ferdinand was assassinated. Um, there was then a chain reaction of um, Germany uh, tying up with the Austro-Hungarian -Hung Empire to attack Serbia. But Serbia was an ally of Russia. So Russia mobilized. Germany then declared war on Russia. France was a, um, a, an ally of Russia. So France mobilized. So Germany declared war on France. And when Germany declared war on France, Britain declared war on Germany. Now, so from the 28th of June to the 4th of August, when we declared war on Germany, that was only, what, six weeks or something. And, you know, if anybody had actually sort of stood at the beginning and thought, now, hold on a minute, this is something which potentially is going to um, create enormous geopolitical problems throughout Europe. We've got to think quite hard before we do anything. But did they do that? No. And we've got a similar situation, I think, in, 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 in the Middle East at the moment. I think it started when Mohammed bin Salman um, effectively took over uh, the the uh, prime ministership, the um, if you like, the executive control over the Saudi Arabia as 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 crown prince. Now, the first thing he did was he locked up all the people who were on the take. Now, when I say on the take, these were basically the people who were being funded by the Americans, in particular, to keep. Saudi Arabia on side. It was a very good living if you were a member of the royal family and you know you you knew the guys in New York. I mean, my goodness, you know, not only were you get you sort of you know not only were you a major shareholder in Citicorp, um, you know, you could be on the board of this, board of that. Um, you could open doors, commissions, the whole thing. Absolutely wonderful. MBS threw that away, and when he threw that away, he threw away American influence over Saudi Arabia. Now put yourself in the position of Israel. You see the Arab nations, the Muslim nations, and also Iran coming in suddenly, you know, they're all coming together. This divide and rule, which is America's approach to managing the Middle East is now dead and buried. You now have the Arab nations, the Muslim nations coming together and agreeing, we are all of the same faith. 
And we all have the same interests, whether it's hydrocarbons, whatever, or whatever. If you're sitting there as Israel, you look at this and you look at, um, you know, the Muslim world coming together and you feel very insecure. Now, the two ways in which you can you can go up with this, because this is a real threat to, to, to Israel, make no mistake. One way is you could try and um, improve your relations with the Muslim world. And that would also involve um, making the political conditions for the Palestinians acceptable to the rest of the Muslim world. In other words, you would have to go out on a very serious diplomatic mission in order to do it. That's one way in which you could do it. The other way in which you do it is you try to eliminate the Palestinians. Now, because the Likud party's, uh, um, um, if you like, constituency, its supporters are basically, you know, ultra Jews um, plus um, very much the sort of the working classes. In other words, the sort of rather reactionary um, uh, lot, they went that way. You can see how this has happened. Now, if you understand that, then you can see that, um, you know, why uh, Israel wants to get America and um, her allies in backing her, actually, not just backing her and making the right noises, but attacking Iran, trying to, to neutralize Iran. But America knows that this is a very dangerous, dangerous game. And she's desperately trying to resist getting sucked into this. I mean, you, we had, um, uh, there were three uh, reservists attacked um, at um, Tower 22, which is a sort of outpost on the uh, northeastern corner of Jordan. And um, you can see the political problems that something like that causes. The reaction, the political reaction, when you had... Uh, Republican senators in, in kick-ass mode saying, we've got to go and kill the bastards sort of thing. You know, this is this is the sort of problem that, that the Biden administration has to deal with in terms of managing a very delicate situation. Now, I think I think that the um, Iranians are not going to stoke this one up. One of the problems they have is that they've indoctrinated all sorts of, um, you know, factions. I mean, you've got the Houthis, you've got Hezbollah, you've got also um, a sort of a, a bunch of different um, uh, terrorist groups uh, or guerrilla groups, however you like to describe it, in, 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 in uh, uh, Syria and also in Iraq. And um, these guys are not necessarily under the control of Tehran. Um, they share the objective, if you like, of... Um, um, doing away with the, with the Jewish state, whatever, uh, the, whether it's doing away with the Jewish state or whatever, they see him as an enemy. OK, that's fine. But when it comes to actually taking action, I think the Iranians are paying a, playing a far deeper game because they, they joined the Shanghai Cooperation Organization last July. They are now very much in partnership and in planning mode, if you like, um, for the development of uh, the Asian continent, along with Russia and China. Their new alliances um, with Saudi Arabia and others in the Gulf Cooperation Council is not something they're going to throw away. So what they will do, I think, is that they will try and hold up their, um, their, their position, their stance, as it were, but they will not get drawn into um, uh, into a war directly. Now, whether America gets drawn into it or not, I don't know. But what I do see is that the Israelis are going to become a lot more desperate. You're not going to suddenly see this being reserve, um, you know, um, resolved. Um, I go back to the two options they had right at the beginning. In fact, they had these options. The, the first option they, the, the, they've had always, <clears throat> and that was to come to terms with the fact that they are surrounded with Muslim nations, and they must coexist with them. And that means coming to uh, acceptable arrangements, uh, as far as their uh, neighbors are concerned, about the Palestinians. They haven't done that. They've gone for all out, um, you know, sort of suppression, suppression, and made their lives difficult. They've taken their, their, their um, if you like, traditional lands away from them, and all the rest of it. Um, and it boiled over on October the 7th. Um, now, 
you know, this, the sort of reaction to just try and wipe out Gaza is not something that you can now reverse. And I just don't see them backing down. I really don't see them backing down. So even though the superpowers, if I can call Iran a superpower, which in this sense it is, um, uh, and America and us, if you like, you know, the NATO, um, even though we're trying desperately hard not to get involved, I think you've got an Israel under there um, which is going to continue to try and bring us in to protect it. Um, they have got themselves into a hell of a mess. Uh, and that's the way I'd look at it. And that, I think, is a very dangerous uh, uh, position to be in. And this is... Um, this isn't uh, like um, uh, 1914, um, you know, just going to be a European war, a regional war. This is something which is genuinely global and could escalate onto a global stage. Fortunately, I do think that the really big players in this, and I, I include Putin, Xi, um, and also um, uh, Biden's uh, sort of, if you like, deep state adv uh, advisors do realize the dangers here. So I'm not one who sort of thinks that the Americans are going to just walk in and try and, you know, I mean, there's a guy called Michael Hudson, who's uh, an American economist, and he, he, he did a video recently, and he thought that it would be in America's interest to basically bomb the uh, Hormuz Straits, because that would drive up the price of oil to 500 bucks or whatever you, you, know, you, you, you think. Um, and it would cut oil supplies off to China. Um, and it would give pricing power back to America. Now, come on, <laughs> you know, that, I, you know, that's, that, that is a uh, complete nonsense, because it would crash, about, apart from anything else, it would crash the markets completely. And where, then where would, would the uh, American administration be? No, um, I think this is something which um, people, uh, you know, the, the main players are desperate to try and just keep things calm as possible, knowing that there are things which are actually beyond their control. Israel, on the one hand, and also the guerrilla operations who have been indoctrinated in the past by the, the uh, Iranians have been supplied by the Iranians. Um, the Iranians, I d think, do have some leverage on them but not total leverage. So, you know, you've still got, I think, elements in there which are really very, very concerning. Yeah, we share that concern. Uh, it, there's so much humanitarian pain that's already been experienced by those living in the Middle East, and it looks like that there's more of that to come. Uh, we, we certainly pray for cool heads to prevail and for diplomatic solutions to be found um, that that uh, somehow find a way for people to uh, coexist uh, in peace. It's very, very challenging when there are ideologies that seem uh, opposed to that. So uh, thank you for bringing us up to your, your latest assessment of that situation and how it may have broader implications and, and could put, draw in uh, true global superpowers into conflicts, as has happened uh, at times in the past in major con conflagrations. Um, we also wanted to get your view, since we're here at the end of January, on your look ahead for gold prospects in 2024. We had a viewer asking that question uh, that was uh, looking for your gold forecast and uh, wondering if you can uh, share what trends you're seeing already and what trends you expect uh, may emerge uh, throughout the rest of this year. It's a it, it it's a fascinating well the the two answers to this the first one is really the current technical situation, which I find bizarre. Um, the level of interest in gold is virtually zero, <laughs> yet we're close to all time highs. I mean, when has this happened before? Um, I was interested to see that the open interest on the COMEX contract has more or less collapsed in the last three or four days. I mean, it's gone down from something like 500,000 contracts down to, I can't remember, it's something, it's something like um, 430,000 contracts. I mean, it's just literally fallen like a stone. Now, um, when you look at you know, the various components in this, the, 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 the various players which you get from the commitment of traders figures, um, you can see that the hedge funds are basically not in this market at all. 
their net long position is probably, I think, as of tonight. I mean, we don't get these figures because um, it's every Tuesday and it's the previous Tuesday sort of thing. So um, I'm just extrapolating what I've seen. Uh, I think that we've probably got um, net longs in the hedge fund community, the managed money category uh, of probably in the order of somewhere like, I don't know, 40,000 contracts. Now, the neutral level in the past has been uh, net longs of about 110,000. Now, it has gone negative in the past. Um, so there is some room maybe for uh, the um, uh, level of uh, um, net longs to fall even further, um, but not that much. Uh, interestingly, the um, uh, far larger category now is the other reporters, which basically um, are, if you like, sort of dealers of some size who uh, don't fit into the other categories, whether it's producers, um, swaps or uh, managed money. Uh, and they are now really the dominant um, uh, uh, players on, on the long side. Um, now, interestingly, the, unlike the hedge funds who, um, you know, are very, very speculative and will move, I mean, you know, whether they're following trends or whether they're following uh, spreads of some sort or whatever, um, the the uh, the other reported um, don't take that view at all. And uh, you will have noticed that uh, that uh, there has been standing for delivery uh, in that contract to a greater and greater extent. An awful lot of gold gets actually delivered over time through uh, those contracts uh, maturing. And that it is the other reporters that are doing that. So a lot of the players in there effectively um, have bought uh, contracts in order to sit on them until they expire when they will take delivery. This is um, uh, not what the market was originally set up to do. Uh, and uh, from the point of view of the swaps, which include, which is really dominated by the bullion bank trading desks, um, you know, this is uh, really quite difficult because, um, you know, they can't actually sort of, you know, hit the price in a quiet moment and just shake out some stops um, uh, for a profitable close. So, uh, what do they do? Well, the answer basically, I think, is in the very, very short term, it probably makes uh, the paper market more volatile. Um, I would not be surprised. I mean, if we get, um, uh, say, a slightly more um, cautious approach from the Fed on interest rates tonight, uh, what we could see perhaps is an opportunity uh, to hit gold back under the $2,000 level. And I would expect in that case, it might bottom out around about the 1950, 1960 area, which is roughly where the 200-day uh, moving average is. So that would be, if you like, a, a normal technical reaction, though, um, you know, for <clears throat> for the perennial gold bugs, you know, they might they will scream blue murder, but they always do. Um, but other than that, um, you know, we have to look at the fundamentals um, and the fundamentals. It's not we're not talking about fundamentals for gold other than um, what the central banks are doing. The central banks basically are trying to get out of paper currency. Um, it, you know, that's why they're accumulating gold. You know, the central banks are, uh, are trying to get out of <clears throat> paper currency, <clears throat> which is why they're buying gold. And it's paper currency that we've got to look at. Paper currency is losing its purchasing power. I mean, you know, we've already spoken about uh, the position of the dollar where you've got a debt trap. Um, I mean, just look at what's happening to, to uh, um, uh, you know, the U.S. Treasury debt, the, the debt mountain and rising interest rates. What's that going to do to it? You can see that I reckon by the time the new uh, ceiling is fixed, which is due to be done on January the 1st, 2025, we could be looking at um, total debt outstanding in the region of about 40 trillion. I mean, it's, you know, <clears throat> I kid you not, if just, you know, just look at how this is going. And that's the sort of number we're talking about. Uh, so, you know, the US government is in a debt trap. Um, and uh, uh, we've also got a banking crisis, which is underneath the, the surface most of the time, but occasionally it just bubbles up a little bit, as we've seen with New York Community Bank Hall. Um, the economy itself, um, if, you, if you allow for the fact that um, roughly in this fiscal year, roughly three trillion 
of excess currency is being produced by the government, which is going almost all into uh, the, <clears throat> the, the uh, GDP, then that's inflating the GDP nominal number um, hugely. So, you know, if you're going to end up with, say, GDP rising, a nominal GDP rising by something like 4% or something like that, <clears throat> actually, what you're saying is that the private sector GDP is contracting. And if you look at what's going on around you, um, you know, the small and medium sized businesses, which make up actually the majority of GDP, then you can see that, yeah, that's actually what's going on in the country. I mean, this, you know, my friends in America tell me they see this. I see this in the UK. My friends in Europe see it as well. This is this is everywhere. Um, we are actually in a slump and it's only being concealed by the printing of currency credit. And sooner or later, that is going to drive up interest rates again. So really, when it comes to the outlook of, for gold, we are seeing it's not so much gold at the moment. <clears throat> There's no interest in gold, as I said earlier. And also, um, if you look at the interest in gold, I mean, what are the, what are the um, uh, ETFs doing? They're still being liquidated. The public are still selling ETFs. I mean, this is... This is not a, a gold bull market. It's a bear market for currencies. But the one thing I would say is that um, <clears throat> uh, portfolios are so underweight in, in gold and gold related investments. Um, uh, we've got roughly one hundred and fifty trillion dollars worth of portfolios around the world. You know, everything from wealth funds to mutual funds to um, you know, <coughs> pension funds, insurance funds, you know, the whole caboodle, about 150 trillion. The um, investment in that in, in terms of gold and gold related investments is less than 1%. Now, when I tell you that in the past, before um, all the propaganda about how gold is a pet rock and forget it, and the dollar is the new, the new money and so on and so forth, uh, we were looking at um, having a sensible portfolio exposure to gold, uh, which is really like an insurance policy against all the other things you've got in your portfolio going wrong of somewhere between 5, 10, maybe even 15 percent. If you're really worried, we have less than 1 percent. Now, the point about that is that if that was to adjust by 1 percent upwards to less than 2 percent, that is the equivalent of portfolio purchases of over 23,000 tons of gold. Now, the reason I say that is to just emphasize how illiquid the market is. Where does this come from? When you get a swing um, out of these wonderful tech stocks, which have been carrying everybody's portfolio through to the moon, <coughs> when you get interest rates obviously not going to come down as people expect. When you get a bear market developing in um, your normal sort of pharmaceuticals, tech stocks, uh, industrials, and so on and so forth, when that really starts happening and people start thinking we're underweight in gold, you just see the effect on the mines share prices which are right down at the bottom. They really are. Look at the effect on gold itself. You know, when people start going into ETFs or however they invest their portfolios into gold, there is no gold there for them because the central banks have been basically cleaning out uh, the, the, the refiners. <coughs> I mean, there is no big liquidity in the market at all. And as I say, a 1% swing under those portfolio conditions, which is peanuts compared with what's likely to happen is the equivalent of the purchase of 23,000 tons of gold. I think that's the most important thing to understand. And it won't be just a question then of the dollar going down rather than gold going up. It will be both dollar going down and gold going up. I think you could see the gold price by the end of this year moving very, very sharply upwards. Well, Alistair, you've certainly got to, given us a lot to think about, a lot to ponder. Uh, starting with the risks of the banking system, both in the U.S. and globally. Uh, also, real estate weakness, e evidenced by Evergrande and others in China, perhaps e 
emblematic of what's also uh, latent in other countries, including the U.S., where we've had all kinds of toxic uh, loans marked at par. Europe has done that as well. And uh, also the Middle East crisis that looks not on a track to be resolved diplomatically, but we pray for that as a turn of events. And also your gold forecast saying that you anticipate uh, the necessity of gold showing a much higher close to 2024 than, than the beginning right now, because it will need to emerge in people's minds as a relative safe harbor compared to all of these high flying uh, equities that they've currently got themselves into. And uh, grateful for your perspectives here. Now you've got ways that people can follow your work on a much more constant basis than your monthly visits here. Can you please remind people how they can do that? Yes, sure. Well, I I write for Gold Money um, still, and uh, but my my uh, main um, article, uh, which is on Thursdays, is shifting to my Substack. Um, I'll write a brief summary uh, for uh, Gold Money um, uh, followers, and uh, they they can find the uh, full article on my Substack, which is Alistair McLeod dot Substack. Um, easy to find. That will be now for uh, paying subscribers. Um, market report um, will be both on Gold Money and also there will be a market report on uh, my Substack as well. So those are the, that's the way I'm sort of concentrating it. And the reason I'm moving over to the Substack basically is to try and broaden the audience. I want to use social media to get the message out about what's going on so that um, uh, as many people as possible uh, can protect themselves against the events which I foresee. We're grateful for you being here on Liberty and Finance so often over these years and keeping us well informed of potential risks in the banking sector and beyond. And uh, just thank you. If folks, if you don't want to miss a single episode with Alistair or any of our other guests, make sure you get on our free mailing list by going to libertyandfinance.com and putting in your name, your email address, click submit and make sure you confirm on the confirming email then you will get one email in your inbox per day. We will not share your email address with anyone else. And you'll get every interview with Alistair, all of our other guests, and any weekly specials. And as always, Alistair, on behalf of all of our viewers, thank you for joining us again on Liberty and Finance. Well, thank you very much for having me on. This is Kaiser Johnson with Liberty and Finance. And these are the Miles Franklin weekly specials for January 29th through February 5th, 2024, while supplies last. This week we have Silver Valcambi or Asahi 100 ounce bars at just $1.39 over spot per ounce. We also feature pre-1933 gold $10 and $20 liberties at $89 over melt and $139 over melt respectively. Next, backdated one ounce silver maples are at $3.75 over spot with a minimum order of 50. To order our specials or any of the many other options we have available, Call us at 1-888-81-LIBERTY. That's 1-888-815-4237. We're available after hours and on weekends, and we look forward to speaking with you.